In the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Brethren in Christ, Christ is risen. He indeed, is risen he is indeed. Hallelujah. I am here today with my good friend, just Dustin Quick. Dustin, how you doing, brother? I'm good, my brother. Uh, it's very... been a long time. We haven't yeah. talked a long time. Yeah, it's been a while, man. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think we go back all the way to 2015, 2016. Really? That, uh, oh, that long? Yeah. That's hilarious, man. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm honored and blessed to be on your show. Thank you for having me. It's a real treat. And I just pray that God blesses us and blesses our viewers and hearers and Amen. The, the gospel may be spread far and wide. Yes, amen. Absolutely. I think um, I, I think I set up my sound a little bit wrong. Let me let me close this window. <clears throat> oh man. Okay. Yeah. I, I we're we're recording this episode on a Saturday morning. We're gonna do live, but then uh, family thing happened, and now I, so I got the three kids in the backyard while I'm recording this from my office so i think you heard some uh my my six-year-old has a gator from that he got from his grandfather it's like a little toy car that he can right. he can drive so <laughs> anyways so this show is called from rome to islam and back again and mm -hmm. this is going to be uh just a, a celebration it's a it's going to be a testimony of grace that's what uh this is what Paschal Tide is all about. Easter time is about all Catholics celebrating the, the resurrection and especially during Paschal Tide, uh, celebrating the new life that's that happens with catechumens that we witness in our own parishes. But that also uh, helps us renew our own baptismal vows as as mm -hmm. is done at uh, various Easter vigils. Um, it helps us, reminds us of the grace of God in our own lives. And it's always great to just talk about um, the ways that God's grace has worked in our lives so dustin quick has a has his own podcast called holy smokes and in this podcast tell us about your cigar you've got cigars you've got your morning cigar tell us about that and your show yeah well uh in july of 2020 um my wife actually because she always says you know you need to start a blog or, or something because my real passion was temple theology to show how the jerusalem temple of solomon is restored and fulfilled in the catholic church this was one of my this is like my wheelhouse this is what it really excites me it says she said you need to start a blog and i thought i don't really have time to write you know at this stage of my life but she said you know you love podcasts you, you listen to them all the time you watch them on youtube why don't you start your own so she actually uh she said tonight we're going to get your old recording equipment from the basement set you up in the garage and and you're doing this like you're not you're not stalling anymore so uh Ultimately, I started the podcast that very night, and uh, the crux of it, again, is to show how the things like uh, Mariology, Marian Veneration, the Eucharist, the Papacy, uh, the Oil of Anointing, all these things find their roots in the Temple of Solomon, and ultimately, the Catholic Church is the perfect fulfillment of the Temple and the Tabernacle. And I also talk about contemporary church issues and apologetics, matters of spirituality and such. Um, some of my guests so far that I've been blessed to have on include uh, Dr. Scott Hahn, John Bergsma, Brant Petrie, Jimmy Aiken, Tim Staples, Michael Lofton, and I've had uh, you on the show as well, Tim. So uh, I've been very blessed uh, to have you know such an amazing lineup of guests, and uh, I'll, I'm actually going to have Matt Frad on on Monday. So uh, looking forward right on, to that. Man. That's yeah. great. Yeah. So it's been a great Fantastic. time. Fantastic. Great blessing and. Uh, just want to use, you know, the the gifts that the Lord has given me to share with others, and and the good is from Him, and the mistakes are mine, and I and I apologize in advance for any error that I might say unintentionally. Uh, the glory is to God; the mistakes are mine, and I take responsibility, and I ask the Lord for forgiveness. There we go. Perfect way to begin proclamation like that. Now I've got uh, a kid situation happening. Time step five forty five. Just a minute. Yeah. <clears throat> God bless you, man. 
Uh, it's so it's so funny. I oh, I'm wow. so glad that we're recording this because last oh. time I tried to do this live, I was oh, we were right. talking about the Philo Quay on, with Eric Ibarra. <laughs> I like I had to leave for like ten minutes. Uh, you know, like and then just get my Eric get my two year old back out of sleep. It was a disaster. So that's why we're recording this. Anyways, there was a Goodness. little blip. Our viewers just saw a blip because I just edited it out because I had to do some parenting in between this. Anyways, um, yeah, thank God. So I, your story, Dustin, is and it, this is something that I've only kind of gotten a little bit over the years as we've talked. Um, so I'm really excited to hear your whole story. Yeah. Um, so you you so bring us to the beginning. You were baptized Catholic. Were your parents uh, not observant Catholics? Tell us about your your upbringing. Yeah, certainly. So um. Uh, my family situation was my dad's side was Protestant. Uh, my dad is a pastor's kid. My grandpa was a pastor. And my mom's side uh, is Catholic. So my grandma, who's now passed, memory eternal, her name was Mary. And she really wanted me to be baptized in the Catholic Church. And my parents agreed. And so uh, I had a Catholic baptism as an infant. But I didn't receive any of the other sacraments. I, I didn't have a Catholic formation or a Catholic faith life growing up. Uh, I, I took on the Protestant side of things. Um, so that's how my upbringing was. Um, and what, what kind of Protestant was your upbringing with your dad? Well, it was it was non-denominational, more or less, but like uh, the rock, rock and roll church, that type of thing. Like the yeah, mega church thing? like my grandma on, on my dad's side was probably my biggest influence. And she was more of a Pentecostal and uh, to this day, she is one of the luminaries in my life as far as an example of faith, like the way she prays, the way she intercedes for people, the way she witnesses, the way she loves the word of God. Uh, to this day, it blows me away. And I don't know too many people um, personally that have the level of faith that she has. So she's had a big, big impact on my life. Um, so that was essentially my upbringing. Um, but I didn't really have an active faith. Uh, you know, a, a lot of people growing up in, in North America, right? So I'm from Canada, you're from the States, but we can, it's the same context. I mean, we grow up, we kind of just live the, like the way of the world and we're Christian by label or name and it, that's how far it goes. So I would pray sometimes when I would, you know, be afraid of something or getting in trouble, I would be conscious of God. But um that was a pretty much the extent of it. I wasn't, I wasn't a devout kid or anything like that. Um, that st started to change. Things started to change. I became uh, cognizant of a spiritual journey when I was in uh, university. I heard a, I heard a song by a member of the Wu-Tang Clan called uh, Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth, which is an ac acronym for Bible and uh by the artist kill a priest and um i listened to the lyrics and he was talking about how the black people in north america are the descendants of the lost tribes of israel they're the true israelites um blacks are god's chosen people uh the white man is the seed of edom and the enemy and for some reason this appealed to me um so i started you know, recounting how, how I've been taught history. And I, and I, and I would think to myself, you know, all the images that we see of Adam and Eve and Jesus and the apostles, they're all lily white European. Have I, have I been hoodwinked? Has the truth been hidden from me of who the original people of the planet are and what their status in the eyes of God is after being so oppressed for 400 years? So I began to research online this group the black hebrew israelites and uh i started imbibing their doctrines so i started reading more of the old testament i stopped eating pork for a while and i kind of went on this crusade against the white jesus that was kind of my spirituality I, I had fallen into this and and some might you know some might think it odd for somebody who's caucasian to adopt these views but you know when you when you get into university, your eyes start to become open to different things that you had never experienced or encountered before. And I was a, I was in, you know, history. So uh, challenging narratives was at the forefront of sort of what we, what we would do as students, right? So this kind of fit part and parcel with that. Um, 
and then you know 9 11 happened and um at the time i was of the opinion that the god of the quran was the, the satan of the bible and i was very anti anti-islamic uh, no, anti no. Bef can I cut in before we get into that? Yeah. Can I just ask you about the black Hebrew Israelites? Because they, they came up in the news when Nick Sam, I think it was Nick Salmon, happened like a couple years ago at the at the March for Life. Could you could you explain just more a little bit for the audience? Wh what are these black Hebrew Israelites? What do they believe? Do they have any sort of organization or doctrine? Can you just touch on that before we get into 9-11? Yeah, well, I, I don't know too much about the organization and structure. I more or less just went off of the information that I was exposed to. I didn't really look into the genesis of the movement so much. I wasn't really interested in that per se. Um, I do know that they're not a united group. They, they have different factions, sort of like, you know, in Protestantism. Um, they rely solely on the K uh, King James Version of the Bible. Um, they, I, they don't believe in the Trinity. Uh, I don't believe they believe in the divinity of Christ, although he he oh, is the really? Messiah. Yeah, so, so I do they accept the New Testament. Yeah, they, they accept they accept the New Testament. Ah, okay, interpreted in obviously certain ways. So they're um, like a, they're like Arians, basically in terms of doctrine. Basically, of if I'm kind. not mistaken, yeah. And, and then are they are they are they all blacks? Well, well obviously you weren't black <laughs> when you got into it, but no, is it mainly I, I, black a black movement. Well, see, for them, black is an umbrella term. So some of the descendants, some of the tribes, like the tribe of Gad, would refer to the Native Americans. So if you were essentially oh, if you really? were not yeah, essentially if you were non-white, if you were Hispanic, if you were black, you all fall under that umbrella. So you okay. could be a member. As far as whites, I don't think they could be members, but they could be recognized as, you know, like a God fearer. You know, you hear that oh, term. Okay. So they would they would count the sons of Shem and the sh sons of Ham to be the true Israelites, whereas the sons of Japheth, the whites from Europe, are not included there. Yeah, that's they, kind of they their would general be, doctrine. Yeah, they would they would be cursed. Interesting. Yeah. That, well that's so they, they yeah. cursed Japheth instead of cursing Ham. That's it or cursing Canaan rather. Um that's interesting. Um especially when we get into the nation of Islam later. Okay. So okay I just wanted to touch on that real quick because that's kind of a weird yeah. sect. Um yeah. so okay so 911 happens you basically had your general anti-Islamic ideas that floated around at the time. Tell us mm -hmm. what happened after 9-11. So I wrote an article in my university's newspaper uh, basically bashing Muslims because of the war that was going on. Uh, it was written in all caps. I was just um, full of vitriol and anger, which, you know, is understandable, right? So I wrote this article, but I had then stumbled on a lecture online through this you know through the black hebrew studies i came upon the nation of islam and i thought well wow, this is interesting so i listened to a lecture by malcolm x and elijah muhammad's son worth dean muhammad and it was a christmas eve lecture i believe delivered in 1955 or 57 wow now in this lecture and this is back when you know, you could listen to real player files on the internet. So this is a, this is a while ago. Um, but I listened to this lecture and basically it was explaining what, what was the meaning of Islam and who is Allah, who is God, right? So etymologically they broke down Islam as just submission to the creator, which that's what it means. And anything or one that submits is a Muslim, mu is mu Islam, Muslim, the one who does Islam. So um, they said, in terms of historical reality, you know, Judaism comes after the tribe of Judah, Christianity after Christ, Buddhism after Buddhas, and so on. So these can all be traced to figures in history. But they said Islam predates all of that. Islam is the religion of the universe because the sun, moon, stars, trees, rivers, atoms, energy, they all submit to their creator. They're, they're Muslims in, in that sense. And so who is the original man and woman, the black man and woman? And what is their religion? Their religion is Islam. So for me, I was trying to get to the root of what is the original religion of the original people of the planet? And if I could discern that, then that's what I want to be a part of. 
because that's the root and everything else is a, a derivation or a deviation from that. Right. That's sort of how I started to open my heart and mind to the idea of Islam. But of course, Nation of Islam's doctrine is that God is the black man in toto. And he has a council that surrounds him. So you read about like the divine council in scripture. So there's 12 gods and one of them is supreme. So these would be like the 12 ma major scientists, they call them. And then the one who sits as judge as supreme over all of them, that is the Allah of the age. So this person, his wisdom would carry on for 25,000 years, but the person who would occupy that seat would change. Very, very peculiar. Um, and of course, like the black Hebrew Israelites, there was a common theme. The white man is the, not, not just the enemy, but he's the, he's the devil who was created through a process of grafting from the original man into the white man who is weak and wicked, weak bone, weak blooded, and just an inferior species. But the, the peculiar thing about that is it was this God, Yakub. He was one of the, the scientists, the, the God, Yakub. It was his idea to create the devil. He wanted to bring out what was the worst of the original man that was already within him, give it a physical form and identity for the black man to overcome and thus overcome what was already evil latent within himself which is peculiar so if you're going to call the white man the devil where where did the idea of the devil originate it originally it originated with a black god who wanted to bring what was unholy out of the black man by giving it an external form so that's very that's very curious and i actually wrote my master's dissertation on the nation of islam's view of whiteness and how it sort of started and how it evolved over the years so how I, how I could square myself being associated with this movement was Elijah Muhammad taught that a white, a white man could never be God, but he could, be, he could become what's called a Muslim son by being righteous and submitting to Islam, believing in his teachings. He could be called a brother in faith, but not a brother in humanity because he's inferior genetically, physically to the original man. So that's how that kind of worked out. I never fully embraced all the teachings of the Nation of Islam, um, but I was sympathetic to a lot of them, especially their view of history um, and their view of God as being visible and in human form. Because I started to read the Old Testament and I would see these theophanies of God appearing as a man. So I thought, you know, this, this makes a lot of sense. And when I did become Muslim, I actually... I didn't accept that version of Islam. I accepted Sunni orthodoxy. But all the while, I still had these sympathies and these tendencies towards some of the nation's doctrines. So I never quite really fit in with the Sunni orthodox framework. So I kind of hid that for a while. And then it came to the fore at certain points. Um, interestingly enough, I, I met and connected with a scholar of the history of religion. He taught, he was got his PhD from the University of Michigan, uh, Dr. Wesley Muhammad um, or Wesley Williams. And he, he made it his life's work to vindicate the teachings of Elijah Muhammad academically through the study of the history of religion to show how this isn't something that was invented in 1932 with the appearance of who they deemed the Messiah God in person, Master Farad Muhammad, but this is something that could be traced to antiquity through all the major religions, and it was perfected and made manifest to the black man and woman in the hells of North America. So, uh, yeah, very, very peculiar stuff, but oddly enough, you see, because in Orthodox Islam, the idea of a manifest God is heretical. It's blasphemous. You know, that's something the Christians believe. But through my interactions with the nation of Islam and my sympathies toward them, that ultimately opened the door for me to be able to accept the idea of the, the Christian concept of the incarnation. God in person is wow. not Master Farad Muhammad, it's Jesus. Hmm. 
And I actually, wow. I actually met um, a brother who's a dear friend of mine to this day for about 10 years plus. And um, he, he was a student of Wesley Muhammad and a friend of his. So we started talking. And you know, there's this interesting tradition in early Islam of Allah coming to Muhammad in the form of a young man between the ages of 30 and 33. So, and, and this is not talked about in many Orthodox circles. This is kind of obscure, but nonetheless, okay. it was a part of the uh, the theology and the Hadith tradition of Ahmed ibn Hanbal, one of the Sunni jurists uh, that was, you know, quintessential in the formation of Sunni Orthodoxy. Okay. All right. And so, you know, we would talk about these traditions, and I said, it's funny how the Christians think that jesus became god and this and that and i kind of mocked the idea and he said to me well you know when god appeared to muhammad in the form of a shab or a young man he's like that's the divine christ and when he said that so many windows just blasted open and i i literally crawled in the fetal position because i i was instantly hit with this this revelation that have i been wrong about jesus this whole time is he really is he really God incarnate? Have I have I missed the boat this entire time? Have am I being led to this uh conclusion through this weird obscure journey that I never thought would bring me here? All this all these emotions, all these thoughts were just crowding in and it was overwhelming. Wow. So <clears throat> well that, that that's incredible just a testimony to God's grace and how he brings good out of evil. It makes me think of the the Muslim veneration of Mary and how mm -hmm that can bring in, in for example in egypt muslims will come and venerate mary in shrines because they they do venerate mary and uh it can be a a bridge to baptism but right. what what uh can you tell us more about because you um did you have any sort of encounter or relationship or belief in jesus christ before you said the shahada and kind of went sunni or was it just sort of external to you well, like I said, before I before I encountered anything from the black Hebrew Israelites or the nation of Islam, yes, I, I profess Jesus as my Lord and Savior, of course. He died and rose for my sins. Um, when, I be, when I started sympathizing with the black Hebrew Israelites, Jesus was, you know, the black Messiah and the Son of God in some sense. When um, I encountered the nation of Islam, I had some difficulty because, you know, to them and to Orthodox Muslims, Jesus is the prophet and the Messiah, but he's the creature. He's a creature nonetheless. And so what it was only when I encou <clears throat> encountered this brother who said to me that that man who came to Muhammad was the divine Christ, my theology began to shift because at the time, this brother, he was, he he was a Muslim. He believed in the Quran. He believed in Muhammad as the last prophet, but he also believed in the biblical Christ. So it became my position that the Bible and the Quran are both scripture. They're both from God. Muhammad is the final warner, the final, the final prophet. However, Muslims have misunderstood the Quran's condemnation of christians or the type of christianity that it purports or their view of the trinity or whatever they're just wrong about jesus these things can be harmonized jesus was crucified he is the savior so that was my theology for a while i guess in a tongue-in-cheek way you could call it chris Lam, but uh, well, there is a name for that there's a website for that um i i can't remember the name of it it's like it's something like chris Lam or you know what website i'm talking about i don't even remember what it was i found it years ago but um i mean the problem just historically just for viewers the the muslims invaded just historically speaking the muslims invaded all of these all of the lands that are in the middle east except for arabia to this day are were strongly christian lands even in iran in the east in the east yeah. under the persian empire but the whole middle eastern in israel north africa it was all christian and so historically there was a lot of mixing and there is to this day as you just said, you know, right. and like Sufi, uh, like Sufis, for example, is some some say certain forms of Sufism are just blends of Christian or like former Christians who became Muslim and they just sort of blended their Christianity with all sorts of different mixing happened. Yeah. Uh, so it's interesting that there is I know it's a it's a small sect, but I don't, I don't really remember what it's called. 
if there's a name for that i don't even know if christian yeah. islam yeah i don't know if there's a formal i i guess you could say christocentric islam i mean it was it wasn't something well defined it was and you know because i i had sola scriptura i could kind of bend things to fit any narrative that oh, i wanted okay. right that's right. what that's what made it right. easier because i would just interpret certain quran i would insert uh, interpret certain quranic passages outside of the oral tradition of islam to fit my view and i would do the same with the bible uh so you know the idea that you go by the quran alone or the bible alone in both communities is heresy but i i didn't care about that yeah you know, i was the last person worried about heresy uh i just wanted truth and to me for for some years that was the truth and so i started attending uh, because when i was muslim and living in my parents house the rule was you can live under this house, but you have to go to church with us every Sunday. So I went to a Presbyterian church. It was kind of on the charismatic side. And I would go and when they would, you know, sing worship songs to Jesus or talk about the divinity of Christ, I would kind of just like ask God for forgiveness or cross my arms or whatever. Like, you know, I just, I didn't want to hear it. I hated it. But this is the church. Now that I've accepted Christ as my savior again, and this time, I had a consciousness of my own sin, my need for him, my love for him. Like, I just wanted to follow him. I just wanted to spend time with him. Now I had a living faith for the first time in my life. And it came through this odd sort of milieu that I had created or had been introduced to and sort of took off on my own. So I went back to this church. I started volunteering. Let me, let me ask you a question real quick. Yeah. And I got to... Just a minute. Yep. Okay, time step. 34 30 so that was only 5 minutes. <laughs> yeah. I got I got to I got to be out by 11:30 just FYI. So Oh, okay, 11:30 Eastern. Okay, cool. Yeah, we um, have to do a part 2, I don't know. No, no, here um here's my question. Yeah. Um did the sort of the moment of grace and the moment of conversion when you sort of had a an encounter with the risen Lord as St. Paul did on the road to Emmaus? Um, would you say that happened when your, your Muslim friend told you about, yes, that, this, that this was it, this okay. happened while I was still, you know, while I still consider myself Muslim, this is when I had my St. Paul moment. So you believed that Jesus was God at that point? Yes. So you believed in the Trinity from that yes. moment? Yes. Wow. <laughs> That's, what, what a grace. Amazing. And, I mean, <laughs> and, and how, how I was able to square that was quite easy. Because the Quran's view of the Trinity was Allah and his consort Mary had a child, a third God, Jesus. So you gotta it's it's kind of curious, right? The Quran is supposed to be the final revelation and warning to mankind from God. And the Christians have perpetuated the worst possible heresy and blasphemy that, against God that makes the heavens rent asunder. So you would think, okay, if this is the final warning to Christians before the day of judgment you're going to get the Trinity right and actually condemn what Christians actually believe. Right. Like I've even looked for evidence of some weird Arabian sect around the time of Muhammad. I can't even, I'd never been able to find it to this day. Yeah. Um, right. It's, it's just a weird, uh, that's why Christian Muslim dialogue is very hard because the Christians say, well, no, this is actually what we believe about the Trinity. But the Muslims say, no, you don't. Cause our Quran says yeah, that you exactly. believe that the Trinity is Allah, Mary and Jesus. So it's nobody like, does. Nobody well, how does. do we how do we get past that brick wall? Because we're we're asking them to disbelieve in the Quran. So that's yeah. a hard. That's, that's funny. That's difficult. How you, yeah. how you reconcile that? So so what happens next in your story? All right. So what happens next is I'm at this. I'm at, back at my church. Right. I, I wanna I wanna get involved. I wanna serve the body of Christ and the head Christ. So I start by cleaning the bathrooms. I do that for a while. Then I start. At, um, doing the slides for the Sunday services. I, I you know, sit up in the balcony and, and tr uh, switch scripture slides or, or song slides. Then I'm editing the videos to be put out on Vimeo. So I'm sort of doing more and more. I'm doing Bible studies. I'm leading Bible studies at home or in people's homes. But also around this time, I become aware of Paul Washer. And I start getting into Calvinism. Oh see, boy. You know, so, yeah, <laughs> this is really appealing to me, especially total depravity. Oh okay. because I had a very low opinion of myself to begin with. So for me to think that I'm 
but a worm very easy and it was natural to me so i'm like you know this has to be true you know god alone is good i am nothing i have nothing to do with anything very There's islamic this, too yeah islamic conceptions of god de yeah. deterministic yeah very much so and so i started immersing myself into calvinism and the church that i was going to i was curious because it was presbyterian and i and i actually looked up for the first time i started to care about denominations and i said well what have presbyterians historically believe and i look up the westminster confession and i see calvinism there i, I see tulip and i get excited i'm like yes i'm part of this church however yeah. however uh not once from the pulpit did i hear calvinistic doctrine espoused so i'm i'm, I'm disappointed this church isn't Orthodox Presbyterian enough, right? So I'm, when I'm leading Bible studies with the people in my church, I'm playing Paul Washer videos for them, and I'm trying to get them, hey, this is what we're supposed to be believing, guys. Let's let's get on board with it. And I'm meeting with pastors and correcting pastors and saying, you know, why you said John three sixteen, but you left out this part. Why are we why are we doing? So I I had a really I had no knowledge and a huge sense of pride, but it was, I, I, I took it for, I was one of the elect, I was chosen. Uh, it's not me, it's God. It's hard truth. You either accept it or you, you let it alone. Uh. So uh, I was very hardcore on the Paul Washer, John MacArthur train. Those are all like Cal hardcore Calvinists. All I know is like, I, I thank God I was never a Calvinist. I was a Lutheran, which is worse but better I don't, I don't know which is worse calvinism or lutheranism lutherans have good music yeah uh, Bach. but anyhow um so so all i know is like john uh is it piper is that the yeah guy? john piper yeah he's like a big calvinist isn't he he he's is like a big okay so these are all all these dudes you're talking about those are all mm. big five point calvinist guys so if you if viewers don't know about five point calvinism thank your lucky stars that you don't know about five luck five point calvinism but five point Stay calvinism away is i mean i would describe it as basically like islam with jesus because it's like god forces everybody forces people to go to heaven forces people to go to hell uh you're you're totally forced there's no free will it's a denial of free will grace is just sort of a foreseen thing but it's it's trying to capture a, a truth which is the sovereignty of god and his omnipotence and of course but it's uh because of the doctrine of sola fide ends up with all these errors and this sort of it's scary view of god honestly yeah terrifying terrifying so i was constantly wondering are the fruits i'm producing are they evidence of me having been regenerated and i was constantly agonizing over this and i had anxiety high anxiety now i i have you know an anxiety disorder but i it was undiagnosed at the time so having that being predisposed to anxiety and constantly worrying about Am I am I one of the chosen? Have I am I a reprobate? Are my works bearing forth fruit unto repentance and all that? And I'm constantly worrying about this. It's driving me crazy. I hate myself. I I I told I once told somebody online. I said, unless you believe that you're worse than dog crap at the bottom of somebody's shoe and you deserve to burn in hell forever, you don't know the gospel. That's what I that's what I said to someone. Woo! So, so I, 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 <laughs> I accept I was, the gospel. I was I was projecting is what I was doing, right? Uh looking back. <laughs> but um yeah, so that I was a hardcore Calvinist in uh 2014 is when that when that started. I severed ties formally with Islam in 2014. I burned a bunch of books in the backyard, uh even Catholic books, God forgive me. I had, we had been restoring a church in Detroit and it used to be a, a Catholic church and it had a rectory and I took all these books that I thought looked interesting and, and Christian enough, but the ones that didn't seem Christian enough to, to me, I, I threw them on top of the Islamic books and burned them in a fire. So I was very hardcore, zealous, um, and God forgive me for, for doing that. So when do you encounter Mary and the Catholic church? So that is... That same year, actually, 2014, believe it or not, um, a friend of mine who I had gone to prayer meetings with, who who was raised Catholic but had a born-again Protestant experience, uh, we were very close. We'd go to prayer meetings in church together, <clears throat> and um, he mess <clears throat> excuse me, he messaged me one night, 
and said, you know, I'm, I'm starting to get back into the roots of my Catholic faith. And you should really check out, you know, this website called Catholic Answers. And I immediately lost it on him. You know, I, I went the whole Galatians route. Uh, you're anathema. You believe another gospel. How could you say these things? What's wrong with you? And he said, bro, if you have time, just watch this debate between James White and Tim Staples on Sola Scriptura. The thing was like three hours long. Wow. And I had, I had nothing else to do. So I figured, okay, I'll watch it. But James White was one of my heroes. So regardless of what Tim was saying, I was rooting for James White anyway. But here was a Catholic, Tim Staples, who was on fire for Christ, who was quoting the Bible, who talked about something I never really heard about before, church history, uh, the popes, church councils, the Eucharist. Like All this was foreign to me. And that haunted me after i finished watching that debate it kind of left a bad taste in my mouth i'm like well james kind of didn't really win this thing but i wanted to believe that he did so from that point on i'm staying up all hours of the night i'm researching catholicism online and i remember thinking that because i had met with this pastor uh, this baptist pastor and i told him you know i found this video on youtube showing how the church fathers were Calvinist and they would pull, they would cherry pick quotes from the church fathers showing that they believed in the five points of Calvinism. And so I was researching this and I like free will in the early church and they didn't believe in monergism. So I brought this up to this pastor and he said, well, the church fathers are wrong. You just need to care about what St. Paul, and, or he wouldn't have said St. But Paul and the scripture writers say, and St. Augustine was right on some things. So, uh, Whatever the church fathers say, if they contradict that, just don't even worry about it. But that wasn't sufficient for me uh, because we had a whole 2,000 years of tradition behind us. How can we just ignore and jettison it? It didn't sound right at all. So I'm staying up all hours of the night, 3 and 4 in the morning. I'm sweating. Uh, I'm, I'm praying. I'm asking. I said, God, I'll, I'll be anything. I'll go anywhere. Don't make me be Catholic, please. Oh uh, yeah, anything but Catholic. That's uh, <laughs> many many a Protestant has, or, or many other religions too. I know the Roy Showman had the same experience as a Jew. Anything but but uh, Christianity. Um, yeah. Is now when does your wife come into the picture? Is she s along with you on some of this journey? Well, um, we got married and we we met in October of 2015. We were married in February of 2014. And we've been together eight years. So uh praise God. Yeah, praise God. And she so when she first met me, I was on this Chris Lom kick. And she, you oh, know, oh wow. She she knew nothing, but she saw my love for Christ. It, right? No, she cradle Catholic? No, no. No, okay. She, uh, she was raised Protestant, very simple faith, but uh a solid faith. Not like me, who would who would waver and doubt and go back and forth. This is just what she believed, and she knew it to be true. And she would always challenge me when I'd tell her about, you know, the Quran doesn't rule out the Trinity, and you can believe both. She would say, no, that's not true. She she wouldn't give me any in-depth theological explanation as to why this chris Lump thing was wrong. She just kept... It frustrated me because I was able to con convince or at least get people to consider my view seriously but she's just like i'm not having this i'm not it's garbage there, there's something about uh women they, yeah sometimes they just they just totally have this intuition and right it, with the truth right and and men can just get into this this rationalized whatever world of platonic forms where we can create our own reality but like sometimes women are just like no this is the truth and that's yeah. that's what i i've had a similar experience with my own wife just just sort of getting me out of my platonic form world yep. getting me down to earth you know just an encounter with the truth so yeah i can relate to that i love it yeah the woman ge the woman genius as the uh, woman the feminine genius right yeah, the right. feminine yeah, genius yeah. yeah saint john paul yeah so very very apropos in my case and i would get frustrated with her right so uh she had no idea later in the year that i was even considering catholicism she had no clue i i hid it from her um, so the reason why I didn't want to be Catholic, and it's a strange thing because no matter what religion or philosophy you encounter of the big ones, anyway, they all have one thing in common R religions and philosophies that would not have much in common otherwise. 
somehow have as the boogeyman the Catholic Church. Interesting, right? Right, right. They all so, have the same boogeyman. Yeah. Right. So as a Muslim, the Catholic Church was the enemy. You know, white supremacy and all that. And uh, as a Protestant, well, that's an easy target. Catholic Church is the whore of Babylon. And I was seeing this this guy. He was like my health guru at the time. He had some great stuff and does have, has some great stuff, food and health wise. But I also started to imbibe some of his conspiracy theories about the Catholic Church. So uh, they will usher in the false Messiah by UFOs or some sort of holographic UFO presentation. That's a new um, one. For me. <laughs> I've never that, it, that. it gets worse. It gets worse. Oh no! Uh, they're behind GMOs. Uh, oh, oh no! Oh Monsanto! And, Monsanto's uh, in the Vatican. Yeah, oh, yeah. And, oh. Uh, they, I thought Vatican corruption was bad, but now that's like going beyond and that's the not, pale. That's not the worst part. The worst part. <laughs> The worst part is they sacrifice babies to Lucifer under the catacombs. Uh, yeah. So wow. I hated, I hated what I thought the Catholic Church was, right? So I'm like, I don't want to be a part of this thing. I, I, but I prayed, I tested the spirits, you know, I prayed, I sought counsel, I studied, and I came to the conclusion that this is the church that Jesus established. This is. And as I'd done so many times before, I didn't necessarily go with my feelings. I went with where I thought the evidence led me, regardless if it was uncomfortable. Uh -huh. Right. So I made an act of faith in 2014. Wow. So so 2014 was uh, when you you were confirmed in the Catholic Church? That was a year later in 2015. Oh, okay. So you, so you made an act of faith just personally to believe in the Catholic Church. Then you entered RCIA. And you were confirmed in 2015. Okay. Correct. And Fantastic. so I came out to my wife and it was just like coming out to my parents as a Muslim. Like it was bad. Right. So uh, mm. my wife said, I don't, I don't know you anymore. I didn't marry a Catholic. What are you doing? She, I, at one point she was talking about leaving me. So uh, I, you know, I tried to give her all the apologetics and then this and that, but I met with my pastor and he said, you know, stop that. Stop trying to beat her over the head. Just don't say anything. Wait Wise. until wait until she's ready. Then lovingly have a conversation with her. And one of the things that I did that sort of softened her heart was we read home, uh, Rome Sweet Home together. So she, I would read Scott's parts and she would read Kimberly's parts. And interestingly enough, when we got to the part about contraception, we were immediately convicted and we stopped contracepting. Wow. So that was a grace there too. Um, and so she started to sort of warm up to Catholicism, but not, not too much. It was only after, it was funny because one night after my work's Christmas party, we came home and she asked me out of nowhere, I wasn't expecting it because it had been months, you know, uh, <clears throat> how do we know which books belong in the Bible? And you said that somebody took some out. So it started with the canon. And then I told her about how, you know, the Old Testament should have seven more books. I told her about what Luther did and what the reformers did. And that's what sort of opened her heart. So um, she came into the church with me in 2015, October 2015. Wow, what a grace. So she, mm -hmm. wow, amazing. I, I, that's see, I, I saw it when I went back when I was Eastern Orthodox, I saw a lot of couples break up because... Uh, you had the man who got really intellectual and he studied a bunch of research. And this is like Protestants just coming into like the uh, reality that there's a hierarchical sacramental church. So in that much, the, we can certainly agree with the Eastern Orthodox. But there was such a disconnect between the man and the woman because the woman uh, often, not always, but just as we as we mentioned before, there's like sort of this intuition of the truth in a in a sort of a visceral way or just a different way than the man because right. he just gets into his books often and just researches his researches. And I, I love what your pastor said to you because that's that's like the same thing that I started telling these these people that I would meet who were right. having a relationship crisis because of this issue uh, to just to just uh, do what you can and, and just not try to force it, not try to argue your wife or your spouse into the church uh, i think that's a great wise counsel because it really just waits for the action of grace and asks that's right. god to do the grace yeah yeah so that was uh, 2015 uh 
actually the my pastor at the time said you don't even need RCIA, but uh, it's good for you know to have a sense of community and be with everybody, and, and so just just do it that way. So I said, okay, no problem, and it was great. You know, RCIA was great. Had a lot of fun. Uh, learned some things and had great sense of community and uh, the parish was beautiful. So yeah, so that's how that happened. So take us from 2015. So now you've been cat. So you just celebrated your seven year anniversary of being Catholic this past Easter. So yeah. here we are in Paschal Tide celebrating seven years of the life of the sacrament. So um, final thoughts, I guess I bring us to from your journey in Catholicism. How's it been? <laughs> do you regret, you regret being Catholic? <laughs> Not for a second. I would yeah, do it. That's what I, if, I, if I had to do it a thousand, a thousand times over with all the struggles, with nothing taken away or made easier, I would do it. Now, you got to understand the magnanimity of this journey. I had, it's a big circle. I was baptized as a baby Catholic. I went all the way from Protestant upbringing to heterodox islam to orthodox islam to chrislam to calvinism back to christ and the catholic church like that's I, crazy can you comment on because this is this is a great story because you came in two years into pope francis's pontificate 2015 yep. and many catholics there's some some prominent prominent catholics out there who have left the catholic church under francis because they've had some kind of crowns as a crisis of faith uh -huh. or something has happened to them i don't know if they're cradle catholics or not but um some people have had a really rough time with their catholic faith under pope francis what are your thoughts on on that uh, and having having converted under francis yeah well um and i'm only speaking for myself because you've asked me uh i if i i certainly not my intention to offend any viewers any of your viewers uh, out there I'm just speaking from my personal experience. I, um, after the dubia came out, I started having some difficulties, and I know you you've expressed the same to me. Um, so then I got into the habit of like paying attention to the news headlines and and you know everybody's saying something and interpreting them in certain ways. It bothered me. Um, it bothered me quite a bit, but I almost actually. In 2016, I was so upset over the state of the liturgy that I almost went into schism to Eastern Orthodoxy. But you, Tim, actually helped me to stay the course because you told me about redemptive suffering. And not only that, you told me to apply it to the liturgy. And so that changed everything to me. Um, I began to have a sense of joy and peace at a regular Novus Ordo parish as I did at a Latin mass parish, as I did when I even stumbled on a school mass one day at my parish that I didn't know it was going to, it was going to happen. I had as much peace and contentment as I did at a TLM upon leaving because I had received the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord. And if he's humble enough to condescend to any altar, then who am I to separate myself? can I justify leaving communion with the sea of Peter? And I remember doing a post where I said, I will endure bad liturgies for the rest of my life. If I have to with gangs of EMCs, bad music. If it means that I die upside down on Vatican Hill with the successor of St. Peter, regardless of who he happens to be. Wow, so, man. And that, that to me was pure grace, unmerited to have this perspective. And fr from then on, my life's never been the same. So with regard to Pope Francis, um, I don't think he's heretical. I don't think he's taught any heresy in his magisterium. Uh, problematic is I think some of the things he says are vague and can be interpreted in different ways. And so to in, in the spirit of charity to give him the benefit of the doubt and give him the orthodox interpretation what he believes personally on some issues god knows best and god will judge but as far as his magisterium i don't see any errors and uh somebody who's helped me actually see that and be confident in that is michael lofton of reason and theology he does a great service to the church and the reason why i, I bring him up is because he's not just biased he's not 
a Pope Francis fanboy, as it were. He he actually is very critical of the pontificate. Uh, he doesn't like it. He's made this abundantly clear, so I'm not speaking out of turn. But yet and still, he's still able to show how the magisterial acts and teachings of Pope Francis are not heretical and to respect him as our Holy Father and to love him and pray for him. Uh, so that's basically my position. But I was very caught up and I agonized over the headlines and stuff before I learned about redemptive suffering. I carried it into the Mass, but I also carried it into the journey with Pope Francis. And so I'm at peace. I, I have been at peace with Pope Francis for a number of years, and I remain so only by the grace of God. I try not to read too many headlines and, and stuff like that. It just I just want to quiet my soul. I just want to live a Catholic life, live my vocation as husband and father, priest of my home. I do a terrible job a lot of the time. Um, I'm just going to be honest. I struggle with, you know, mental illness and it's really a hard cross to bear, but I know that with man, it's impossible with God. All things are possible. So if I just keep clinging to the cross, relying on grace, I hope to be the man, the husband and father that God has created me to be. Um, so that's my mission. And, you know, with the podcast, obviously the cigar thing, cigars have always been a, a passion of mine. Um, in moderation, of course, as Chester as Chesterton said, the pint, the pipe, and the cross go together in Catholicism. I would just substitute, <laughs> I would yeah, substitute the word pipe for cigar because I'm not a I'm not a pipe guy. But uh, yes. yeah, absolutely. I love what you said, Dustin. I I love because you know whatever your opinion, viewers, whatever your opinion is of Pope Francis or this or that thing in 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 church politics these days, we all need to have peace of soul with mm -hmm. whatever is happening. We could be in, in 1600s Japan and we lost all our priests. So, well, suddenly we don't have any sacraments. Peace of soul. Because our 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 life as Christians is the cross. It is yeah. the cross of Christ. That is our glory. And this especially in Paschal Tide when we we it's a it's a time of venerating the glorious wounds of Christ that he, that he showed his wounds to his disciples his disciples after his resurrection. And so he the, this is our glory it is loving this suffering and, and having this peace of soul, um, which nothing can take away, no matter what, even if we're killed. You know, it, so I, I love what you said, uh, Dustin, because I, I hope that I hope that gives a lot of viewers some uh, some great wisdom here from this grace that's in your life, Dustin, because I think that there's a great wisdom in what you just said. Just we need to maintain the peace of soul. We need to live in, in peace in our soul because if we're in a state of grace, we have everything, you know, the, this, the, the possession of sanctifying grace and the idea of dying in a state of grace is literally the life of eternal uh, beatitude. It's the life of heaven right here on earth. And we need to have peace of soul in that. If we don't have peace of soul, there's something wrong with us. Yeah. Not wrong with the world. Something wrong with us. Yeah, it's work that we have to do. And and let me just state, no matter how difficult things get, because it could always be worse. But look, we think that we have difficult here. Just imagine trying to be an, an apostolic Christian in the Middle East or Africa. Like, we really don't have it that bad. So we need to remember the poor and the persecuted amongst our brothers and sisters. If yes. they can endure that with joy then there must be some way that we could go about our Catholic lives in North America. And we should even be more joyous than them. They're getting martyred and killed and tortured. Mm -hmm. um, we, we suffer a different kind of persecution, you know, from the, from the secular uh, sort of ideology and all the things that are against the church, against us, the world, the flesh, and the devil. We could all relate to that, of course. But uh, let me just state that schism is never justified. So if you have the grace of being Catholic, under no circumstances do you leave the church you stay you fight for your family whatever vocation you're in if you have a family fight for your family because it, your your job is to, to help get your family to heaven so stay and fight um, remain in communion with the holy see because as the formula of hermistas stated which ended the occasion schism if you're not in communion with the holy see you're outside of the church this is in the year 515, by the way. Yeah, this, is, this isn't this is something that they invented in the, the, the high Middle Ages. Um, no, this is ancient apostolic teaching. You, you remain in communion with Peter C. and his successors. You offer your sufferings for the difficulties that you may have 
in remaining in communion, as long as you stay faithful and just try to live your Catholic life, just watch the graces come. Watch the peace come. Try not to, st- if, if, if it's a stumbling block for you to read Catholic headlines, try to limit that. Try to cut out, cut out the cancer. Just leave it alone. Uh, do something else. Pray the rosary. Like the rosary, and another thing, you know, I started praying the five decade rosary. It took me years, but I'm now at the place where, by God's grace, I could pr- I could put I could pray most of the time the 15 decade rosary, and that's been a huge grace in my life. Wow, awesome! And and you've been a grace in my life. You you knock sense into me when I almost went overboard. So you you and your apostolate has also been a huge grace in my life. Well, thank God. We're, this is, uh, I mean, this is just God. God is so merciful. We need to yeah. celebrate the Lord in, in Paschal Tide with, with lots of uh, pints and cigars and merriment and singing. And coffee. I, I, I love the, oh, yeah. <laughs> here we are. Well, yeah, I don't know when, we'll, when I'll premiere this, but it's uh, 11 a.m. right now. But uh, I love, yeah. one of my favorite Ooh. ones is, um, where'er the Catholic sun doth shine, there's always laughter and good red wine. Yes. At least I've always thought it so. Benedict Camus Domino. <laughs> was that was that Hilaire Belloc or yeah, it's it, was, Belloc. it was? Yeah, I love that one. So, uh, well, Dustin, thanks so much for uh, telling some of your story, telling your testimony to Grace. Uh, let's offer a hail mary to to praise God and thank Our Lady for her intercessions and obtaining the graces that we need. This is the icon of Our Lady of Fatima, ru- written by a Russian Orthodox Christian. This is Beautiful. what we've been trying to promote as a as a means to pray for our brethren in uh, ukraine russia uh for peace and so we we ask our lady to pray for all of us to obtain this peace of soul to obtain the grace that we can we can live in this peace of soul that dustin's talking about no matter what happens no matter what happens in our society or in church um that we can live in paschal tide always because really, Paschal Tide, we always worship on Sunday because the Sunday is the day of the resurrection. Right. So we need to live in that Paschal joy. So let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Christ is risen. And... Oh,